Welcome into another episode of Executive Sessions where we discuss trends, developments, and other topics surrounding the industrial manufacturing sector. I'm your host, Clayton Gullett, and we've got a wonderful show lined up for you today. I'm joined in studio by our guest to my right, the co-host, the co-founder, and the man of the year, <laughs> Mr. John Stewart. <laughs> Welcome to the show, John. Uh, thanks, Clayton. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm glad I could be here. Yeah. So uh, I gave Clayton a little too much happy juice today. That's right. But don't tell anybody except my doctor because I need more. Anyway, to my left is Dr. Simon Sheather, the dean, the trust chair, and the data analytics and professor at the University of Kentucky's Gatton College of Business and Economics. That is a mouthful of a title. It is, Clayton. <laughs> Delight to be here. I'm going to do a shout out to my sponsors. Truest, Truest Bank, I own hold the Truest Endowed Chair in Data Analytics. Oh, wow. All right. Well, that's quite the impressive title indeed. Do you? Okay, I have to know. Do you put all of that on a business card? I do. And oh my I gosh. push faculty fellow <laughs> at the Beam Spirits and Bourbon Research Institute. Oh, my God. So does it wrap around the back of the card? Yeah, it just about. Okay, great. <laughs> you have to use one of those QR codes. You have to scan it to see what its title is. It just keeps going, and then you flip it over. It's like, we ran out of space. Here's a code. Just, yeah. just scan that. Well, today, uh, we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence. And currently, artificial intelligence is reshaping the world around us, especially how we do business. With companies now streamlining processes like never before, productivity is increasing, environmental impacts are being reduced, and workers are experiencing safer working conditions than any other time in history. But there are still many unknowns. So on that note, let's dive in and start talking about an artificial intelligence in the manufacturing space. Simon, I've got a question for you. <laughs> of questions. What are the biggest challenges and opportunities for implementing AI in business? Let's. I'm. Um, I'm a glass three quarters full guy. So let's talk about opportunity. Okay. So a lot of menial tasks can be automated and can be set up such that errors are greatly reduced. So if you want to write a Python program, AI can do that for you. If you've got an Excel spreadsheet with your customer orders for the last month. It can automatically generate bills. Okay. So simple things uh, can be done much more quickly and with less errors. A mate of mine runs a real estate company and they have a lot of apartments and houses that they rent out. And in the old days, they would go through leases and write down all the terms and conditions into a spreadsheet, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas you can take the PDF file and have an AI program pull all that out for you automatically. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, that's definitely going to make make things a little quicker. When you said that, you're just writing everything down, well, my grandfather was alive because uh, he, he was super big into numbers all the time. And, like, he'd always keep track of, like, stocks and stuff on a daily basis, even though he didn't have it. I, I guess it was just something to do in retirement. <laughs> but he had, like, this giant catalog and he'd always write everything down. And he, I would come over and be like, hey, Papa, you know, what's going on? And he'd be like, stock market's not doing good, Clayton. And I'd be like, what do you mean? And he'd be like, well, here, and he'd put it up. And he'd be like, you can see, like, Apple's down and Coke's down. And I was like, do you own stock in that, though? And no. It's like, okay. <laughs> just, kind of, just kind of a good old time. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> John, I've got a question for you now. How can small and medium-sized manufacturers afford and access AI solutions? Well, I mean, today there's a, there's a, a numerous different opportunities for people to access it with some of the uh, bigger platforms. So Amazon and Apple, Google, uh, ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI. So there's, there's all kinds of tools that are accessible, whether there's apps on your phone uh, that can help you to do simple tasks like writing emails or sending messages or or creating invoices, as Simon mentioned, these are all relatively easy. And Microsoft has them built into the Microsoft suite now. And so that you can uh, develop, simply develop them uh, yourself, even using AI to develop AI tools. So uh, there's a there's just uh, a lot of opportunity and people need to just um, embrace uh, it as a tool. And that's what it is. Like, you know, at, again, I, and there's a lot of commentary about it as far as like artificial like intelligence you know, really, it's still an algorithm. You know, it's still using, um, you know, more complex models 
and 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 they're more complex and they allow the AI to learn more and be able to do more. Uh, but there it's it's not like um, it's not like true artificial intelligence, like something that was created from nothing, you know, that's all of a sudden going to, you know, start doing stuff on its own. Uh, I, that's not where artificial intelligence is today. Uh, it may get there one day. That may be, you know, part, you know, something that um, is a threshold that's crossed. But right now, yeah, uh, it's a tool that people should embrace. And I think people are concerned about uh, things on the surface without really digging into the details. Uh, to try to understand more about um, uh, what the opportunities are. So like one of the things that we're doing at Middle Ground, we're looking at like a way to to have use AI uh, at, for a podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, it was a good run, everybody. I guess I'll be replaced then. No, we, we use AI to track how many bad jokes you tell on this sh- uh, show. Oh God. Well, I think it's like super helpful. <laughs> How many times little John actually comes to the office? I mean, it's, it's, it's endless. Uh, John, we, uh, we need to find that program and, uh, take it down uh, as quick as we can. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent sure he'll edit all of this. And so it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, John, um, are you, uh, seeing any sort of implementation right now uh, I know you mentioned middle ground, but any of your portfolio companies, uh, are you seeing any of them starting to embrace AI and technology or are mm-hmm. they more apprehensive about it? No, no, no. I think, uh, I think people are trying to embrace it. Um, and again, um, Salesforce is a good example. Salesforce.com. A lot of our companies use that as a CRM tool and, uh, they're starting to adapt AI to do different tasks and it's, it really can speed things up. Um, and even like book customer calls and, and schedule customer uh, interactions. Uh, and, uh, so there, there's a lot of really good tools available. And so our, our, we're, you know, our teams are embracing those, uh, we're embracing it here, you know, at middle ground as well. I use the tools. Uh, if you, uh, if you get emails from me, they probably, uh, seem a little bit more, uh, comprehensive and that's cause I run everything through, uh, uh, AI before I send it. Um, and so, um, uh, it, it helps with internal and external communication. That's a, that's a really brilliant point. So let's talk about communication. I get to write a lot of thank you notes as the dean, yeah. and it's a good way AI can freshen them up. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so, good. But I don't speak American, so I don't just generically say, write me a note about this. <laughs> Give them last year's note and ask them to freshen it up. And so one of the things I did today for fun was I asked ChatGPT to write a poem about John Stewart, the managing partner at Middle Ground Capital. You go, and if you'll indulge me, I'll start a few paragraphs. We can set the scene. We'll, we'll add some music in post. So it's really like sincere and emotional. In the realm of business, a titan stands tall. John Stewart, a lead admired by all. Managing partner of Middle Ground Capital's domain, where investments in B2B companies reign. In the corridors of commerce, he strides with grace, navigating markets each challenge you'll face. With a vision that spans both continents wide, in North America and Europe, he sets his stride. In the lower middle market, his expertise shines, crafting strategies where opportunity entwines. Industrial and specialty distribution, his forte, building success stories, each one to adore. With wisdom and insight, He charts the course through peaks and valleys with unwavering force, investing in ventures with potential so bright, guiding them onward toward growth's pure delight. A steward of progress, a catalyst of change in the world of private equity, he's rearranged. John Stewart, a name that echoes with pride in the annals of business, his legacy will abide. I can't believe you wrote that. (laughs) I could have said it better myself. <laughs> I I don't have a poem prepared for either of you. I think I should put that on my business card. I, I think yeah. I think you should just be like John Stewart and be like, who? And you'd be like, here, read this. Yeah. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So obviously, we know that ChatGBT can write lovely, flattering poems. Uh, what are you seeing as far as in the academic world and the use of ChatGBT? So I just came back last week from a business school dean's conference in Barcelona and artificial intelligence, chat GPT, the Microsoft product Copilot is all the abundant, part abundant discussion from deans. But one of the smartest things I heard was a dean from the West Coast of the US has 
um, an ethics course in artificial intelligence. He says that AI is changing every week, but the ethics is not. So they're partnering with Silicon Valley and having a state-of-the-art ethics course. So I'm very excited about the opportunity, and I would hope that at Gatton College we can produce an online version of such a course. Mm. Somebody was telling me about some high school students in Georgia that took photographs of young women and then used AI to produce, you know, explicit rude photographs of that those oh wow young women. So we need to get ahead of this, and um, you know, get the students pointing in the right direction. I'm delighted to say that most of the Gatton faculty are embracing AI. So I know some of them set. Uh, an economics professor gets AI to do a dashboard and then has the students critique the dashboard. Oh. Another one gets ChatGPT to write an essay on a topic and gets the students to grade the essay. Mm. So it's a bit like in the old days, people said, oh, the world is falling in. You can take a calculator into a finance exam. Yeah. But we got over that. Mm. In the old days, the professor used to write on a chalkboard and we wrote all the same stuff down. Now we hand out all the notes, put all the notes up on the, on the learning uh, system ahead of time. So I think the strong will get stronger and the weak will suffer. So there's this famous story up, I'll just say a school district in Kentucky, not in Lexington, in another big city in Kentucky. The first day back, they used AI to redo the bus timetables, school bus timetables. There were kids still on the bus at 10 p.m. the first day. They closed down the buses for a week to sort this out. Oh, my gosh. And so the problem there is what John mentioned before is the underlying human intelligence was not used. So what they've done is they've technically overfit a model and haven't checked that the solution is feasible. So there's always going to be need the high-level intellect to partner with AI. AI does the simple stuff, but the the commander in chief is the human. I got gotcha. you. I, I mean, that makes sense too. I mean, I do feel like when a new technology comes along, a lot of people put just, they're like, well, I'm all in on it. And like, there's no question. And then like, it starts to backfire at different points. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe we should have taken a little more time. on <laughs> Well, so I do have another question for you regarding the academic world is, uh, do you think that chat GPT will potentially impact like, the readiness of the next generation coming into the workforce. I think it, I think it will. I think people will be expected to know how to use chat GPT to speed up and automate tasks, but it's not perfect. I like to type my own name into chat GPT. <laughs> she, there is a really distinctive name and it always gets things wrong. I've won a mathematics medal in Canada. I've been the president of the Indian Statistical Institute. I got a degree from Cambridge. I worked at Rice University. Never finds the University of Kentucky. <clears throat> so these things are, are imperfect. So you still need to know what you're doing. And if you saw the story in the New York Times where a lawyer wrote a brief using chat GPT mm -hmm. and it was all gibberish. None of the cases. Yeah, there was like fake cases. It generated fake cases because if it's available on the internet, it can't decipher between whether it's fake or not. Yeah, so we spent a lot of money at the business college to buy this panel data on households. You study household finances. What was the effect of, of all that money that households were given during COVID? And the biggest technical thing there is to, to model the correlation within a household of money across time. And these AI systems are not up to that. Mm. They just mess their pants. <laughs> they just... <laughs> do, do, spin the wheels. I got you. So there's still a whole generation yet to come. The scary things are it can emulate people's voices. So if we took this and put it in an AI program, it wouldn't know how to do future recordings of us. Mm -hmm. So I had a colleague, I had a colleague give a presentation to an advisory body and the first part of it was his voice. The second part was AI reading out his voice. And I, I was clueless about the difference. So that scares you. Get a phone call from your mother saying, Clayton, 
You're a terrible son, though. <laughs> Best Mother's Day. <laughs> Send me a check. <laughs> I'd like to be your mum. That's true. That's very true. I actually did read something about um, uh, there were different groups that were actually calling, and they would they would capture the voice of somebody, and then like they would they would call them, and they would say, "I'm I'm being held at gunpoint, yes. and like if you don't send this money to this this address, they're going to kill me." And uh, I don't know. I just like there just seems like it seems like with a new technology, it's uh, it's two step for it's two steps forward and three steps back because like there brings this whole other realm, like you said, of possible challenges, the way that people could use it, and it could be a problem. But also at the same time, there's there's a lot of bright there's there's a lot of opportunity for the future. Um, I think it's interesting. Simon mentioned these students in Georgia, what they did. Uh, if you look back as, especially with the, in the internet age, but even before, um, that w- as technology evolves, one of the natural uses people use it for is pornography. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of, it's, 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 it kind of tells you like, and, and probably most of that are men. And so it just tells you how simple men are. Like we, you can give us this really multi-billion dollar tool that was all this money was spent. And the, you know, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find some way to make naked women pictures, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, um, uh, you know, and, that, and that's one of the things that streaming like Netflix and all that, that we have, one of the main drivers of that was people wanting to view pornography online. And so online pornography, and there was a lot of money poured into it. One of the first uses was pornography. So. Anyway, who says that uh, it, it doesn't have any benefits to society, but it maybe pushes us on technology. But I agree with Simon. There needs to be ethics around it. And, you know, the same thing with students. I was going to say the same thing as he had when I was a student. Like if you tried to use a calculator, you know, uh, during a test, you know, like the teachers would be like had throw a fit. Um, and then when I went back to school after I started working and, you know, it was more on, you know, there was literally instruction on how to use the calculator to, you know, to maximize the effectiveness, you know, and, and the same is with Excel, you know, when, when we started with Excel and now there's, you know, classes on, you know, how to, you know, maximize the usage of the technology. And so, you know, I, I think education has to embrace the technology. There are certain things that it shouldn't be used for, you know, like if, um, if, if, um, you know, if you're taking an English exam and you're supposed to write a, you know, a, a composition or you're supposed to put a paper together. Well, yeah, you should probably do that yourself and not have, you know, AI do that because it, it's, it's evaluating your ability to, to master that skill, not the, your ability to master the technology to master that skill. But in, in some instances, it may be completely appropriate to, you know, um, uh, let students use the AI tools and see how successfully they can. That's one of the ways that you can, um, weave in uh, some of these ethics and because right. you had to have to be taught the ethics have to be taught to people we have these testing centers that lock down the computers so you couldn't use ai when you were writing your essay in the test so it's actually more um uh, there's less cheating when you yeah so i would like an alternative reality so we can go back and change the ends of kentucky basketball yeah, that'd be that great. That LSU one when they didn't grab the ball. Yeah. The last shot missed. Grab yeah. the ball. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it would be good to have an alternative ending. I just watched the alternative ending version. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Yeah. I wonder I wonder how that would work out. I, yeah. It honestly seems like, you know, there's there's always a, a line for humanity, like the, uh, the marking point between before fire, after fire, the, the line between before atomic energy and after atomic energy the internet before and after. And it almost feels like AI is that next step. It is. Yeah, I would agree I, with that. I really worry about low level jobs, low level, cler- repetitive clerical jobs will go away. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, so I don't worry about it as much because those jobs are hard to fill anyway. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like in the factories, we have a problem with getting people to do, you know, work that is, you know, um, technology can do. So like picking and placing parts, um, you know, a robot is perfectly suited to do some of those more complex and even more tedious operations, you know, cause we can't hold, you know, it's hard to hold a person's attention span, but you know, a computer, you know, is going to follow its instructions. And so, um, I, I think it can be helpful for that because, and it can help us raise wages. So that's what we're doing across our portfolio. So we have, we have an automation team 
and we're using automation not to replace low paying jobs to make more money necessarily. We're using it to replace low paying jobs and creating higher paying jobs so that we can increase capacity. And so maybe the same thing happens with the lower paying like clerical jobs and the simpler tasks is now you need a higher technical capable person that can use the AI tool to do those things, even though they're going to do more, right? But it should raise the wages of that person. Because they're much more productive. Because they're more productive, right? And I mean, there's and there's some uses of technology, which I think are terrible. And, and I'll call out McDonald's. I don't, I don't eat a lot of McDonald's. I don't go to McDonald's a lot, but I had my grandkids and they wanted to go eat at McDonald's and they wanted to go inside. So we go sit at McDonald's and we go in and we order. Well, I don't know if you've been in McDonald's lately, but they've replaced the people at the counter with these like screens and you go and you have to order it yourself. And, you know, number one, all the selections that you used to be able to make, you know, like you can order, if you go through the drive through you can get Big Mac sauce on, you know, like a regular hamburger, but it's not a choice on the display. So you can't even make the request, but there's no, there's no human interaction. And the only hum- human interaction is someone still got to get your food and hand it to you. Yeah. And, and so one of the things that used to be nice, I thought about when you went to a fast food restaurant and you went inside is there was some human interaction with you, you know, instead of just, you know, the, the menu and you in the menu. Yeah. And so they've, I think they kind of missed the ball and, and McDonald's has done it a couple of times. They tried to, you know, do this thing where they had call centers and other locations that were doing the drive through to try to make the drive. So you would really? go to, the, yeah, you'd go through the drive through and then they would route it to a call center and some other place. And, <laughs> and, and then the call center would enter the order for the restaurant, right? Instead of the person inside, you know, that's got the headset on just like asking what you want with your food. So I think sometimes like the, the technology is, is put to work and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, you know, Toyota, the rule was, you know, if you implement a Kaizen or an improvement and it doesn't reduce the cost, then there's no point in it. Right. And so like if, you know, you, you add all of this technology in and, and now you just made your restaurant like very impersonal, you know, you know, whereas... You know, someone going in and it used to joke, you know, like, you know, the people at McDonald's always ask you, you want fries with that? You know, they, they are always trying to upsell you. Well, you know, now that they have this, you know, this system in place, you know, it, you, you lose, you lose that. And I don't think that's all good. You know, I don't think all of our interactions should be, you know, without humans well, yeah. you know, as a part of it. And then if something unexpected happens, I have three brothers who live in Australia and we're all about the same size and shape. And. Andrew's a contractor and he had a bet with his wife about losing weight. Anyway, he got his truck and the stuck in the drive through <laughs> stuck in this drive through at McDonald's. So you can imagine if this was all done remotely. Yeah. And then his wife called and she's going, what are you doing? And they're going, <laughs> nothing. Supersize those fries, sir. <laughs> What they say? Uh, nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's 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 crazy, you know. And so I think anything can be done to an extreme, and people right. can use it and 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 abuse it, and and there will be people that'll try to replace, you know, some of the lower paying jobs, and that maybe they might be successful, but at the end, you know, it's the technology's just not there yet to where you can, you know, uh, create the same level of engagement and the same experience. Right. Uh, you know, in certain tasks. Um, but that's true of any technology. And and I think phones are a good example. Yeah. You know, your generation, Clayton, you guys grew up with smartphones. And, you know, uh, in, in one of the things we see with young people today is they have a very difficult time interacting, even with one another. Uh, you know, they're, they're much more comfortable, like, texting. Uh, like, my daughter won't even pick up the phone. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you have to text her and say please pick up the phone or she won't answer the phone. Like she doesn't want to talk on the phone. Uh, and there's a lot of young people that are that way. They don't want to like communicate, mm-hmm. you know, and we've got these voices, you know, and, you know, and now we've got AI, they can replicate voices. So maybe they'll, what they'll do is they'll actually replicate themselves with AI and let the AI have a phone call with us yes. that want phone calls, and then they can just do it with a text or something. You know, right. <laughs> Wait, yeah. And so it's 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 just kind of nuts where where all of that kind of goes. But it, it's any technology, you know, and, and it's just how we utilize it. Um, you know, here at Middle Ground, it's an in office culture. Like everybody has to come into the office, and we have to be here. Uh, and we're using we're, we've got a, a pretty robust um, uh, 
team that's working on using AI and machine learning to help us make better decisions uh, and looking at all the data and analytics around helping us to make better decisions on behalf of our investors. Uh, but, you know, to this point, you know, we're not, you know, looking at how to like eliminate anybody's jobs. We're looking at how we can utilize it to make people more effective. And, and if you can remove menial tasks um, and the, just like sorting through the junk mail of your email, you know, um, and AI is a good tool that can do some of those things, but it still has to have good instruction, has to have good supervision, you know, and so all of that has still has to be in place. It's good for coding. So in the summer, for fun, I taught myself Python. For fun? For fun. <laughs> Everybody talks about data science and Python is the new language. Yeah, right. You know, as a dean, there's a, there's a few days around the 4th of July. It's a little bit quiet. Budgets are done. And so I couldn't get the hardest part of all these things is to figure out the instructions for reading in the data, especially when it's coming off the the server and the server's address is like this long and it's got spaces and all sorts of stuff. Chat cheap ET is brilliant at putting in dodgy code and saying, fix this for me. So in the old days, gotcha. if you were writing, say, a SAS program, you'd have to go to one of the 28 manuals, try and find the page and hope they had an example. Well, these days you can just paste the code in and say, what's wrong with this, mate? And it will come back often with a correction. So again, for students, if they've learned one kind of coding language, they can quickly transition to others, mm -hmm. you know, because it can translate from Visual Basic into C++ or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I was actually reading earlier and they were talking about how AI was helping with Python as well as I think the coding language was just called R. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, it was- don't mention R. Don't mention R? No. No? Bane of my life. <laughs> I wrote a book once called A Modern Approach to Regression with R, and I provided R code. And every few months, they update the R programs, and the programs are not backwards compatible. Oh, my so, God. So people from all over the world write to me and say, Professor, your code doesn't work. I want you to fix it. It's like, I'm not your research assistant, mate. <laughs> well, you know, that is a good way to like have new versions of your book. Yeah, I should that just put true. it into yeah. ChatGPT and say, yeah. oh, yeah, revise, yeah. revise, yeah. revise it, and then you can make people buy the revised book every yeah. time. Yeah. There you go. Second That's edition, good. third, thirty-second right. edition. I, I get, I get, I get a royalty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was all brought to you here by Executive Sessions to sign right here, <laughs> just in case you forget our branding. Uh, well, that's that's really cool. I mean, it's there. There is. Um, like you said, there's there's two sides to every coin, right? You know, uh, whether you're half full or half empty kind of guy when it comes to looking at a glass. John, I am curious. Uh, you talked about a lot of the uh, implications with AI um, as far as like what's being done here at Middle Ground. What are you seeing uh, that's being used at Port Coves? Oh, I mentioned already. So like on the CRM systems, right. uh, it's, it, we use it uh, and the companies are using it. I would say most of the time, most of the place it's used, it's where it's it's already available in these current programs. So like whether okay. it's Copilot with Microsoft or whether it's Amazon or, you know, whoever they're interacting with. And so they're tools that are specifically kind of developed. And then, you know, again, it's for more of the administrative type of tasks. Um, uh, that's where most of the companies are starting uh, to utilize the tool. I got gotcha. you. Well, Simon, I've got a, I've got another, I've got, a, well, I've got a lot of questions for both of you, but uh, the next one that I've got is, are there any emerging AI technologies that are likely to have the biggest impact on business in the coming years? Uh, the biggest impact on business, I think it's all about trying to automate menial repetitive tasks. I see that as the biggest way to increase productivity. As John explained before, on the factory floor, you can take away some of the low-level jobs, pay people more, and have much higher productivity. I think another scary side of this is who has your information? So you put your CV into one of these programs and say, rewrite it. Where does all that information go? That's a really good point. Some people put their home address, their spouse's name. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they put their social security number, but again, where does all this go? So you've, you've got to be, that's the first question I 
wonder. So I never use this to write letters of recommendation or to update my CV. I'm just kidding. Well, I'm sure the university is happy to hear that you're not updating your CV. <laughs> now, Miss Michelle is sitting over there. She wants me to brag every year on the web. So, yeah. <laughs> Man, I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of potential with AI, it seems. And there's, there is a lot, um, when, when do you think that the conversation comes up for ethics? I know that you had mentioned that briefly, but when does that come up on, on a state level, on a federal level? You know, well, I mean, our government today, I think is, is functional. And I think that, um, I think the, the whole, there's, there's not a lot of leadership in, in Washington, uh, especially around these types of issues. And so I think the kind of current policy, not just with AI, but with a lot of technology is handed over to industry and let industry kind of police itself. Uh, and I mean, you, you see this with, um, autonomous driving, you know, the, the I mean, technically, you know, what Tesla is offering with autopilot is it's not legal, you know, and, you know, I worked for an automaker and if the NTSB told us to stop doing something like you, there was no way that we would keep doing it. And they've been told to stop doing stuff and they continue to do it and just kind of defy, you know, and so I think the government is kind of like pulled back in a lot of these things and said, look, we're going to let industry sort this out. You see that with um, social media. You know, they, the Congress will have these hearings when something happens and then they'll rake Mark Zuckerberg and these guys and they'll bring them in in public and they'll, they'll do it, you know, and, but nothing happens, you know, there's, there's nothing, nothing happens about it. Nothing changes, you know, because of these situations, you have whistleblowers, you know, that blow the whistle on, you know, some of the technology that our, that our government, you know, possesses and, um, um, the biggest buyer of, of information on the internet is the federal government, you know? So like who's buying the data, who's buying the information? It's the federal government. Uh, I, uh, went to a management presentation for a company and, um, they collected data, uh, in cars and, um, uh, the number one customer on there was like customer a or whatever. And I'm like, who's customer a, and they're like the NSA. And so I'm like, what kind of data, like, are they, they're collecting like information on like when drivers turn their windshield wipers on, you know, and when, if they use turn signals or not, when they make turns and it's all a part of understanding behavior. Right. And so, you know, like if they get the data from your car, which your car records all the data, and if they get the data from your car, then they can determine how reckless of a person sure. that you are based on how you drive your car. That's like one piece of data. And if they get your data from Google and they get your data from Amazon and they get your data, they can create this whole portfolio around you to figure out you and what like you're, and that's one of the ways that they are able to, you know, early detect threats, you know, not saying that they're like using it in the evil way, but right. like, I'm just saying that like, I don't think people realize. And Simon's like, where does all this data go? One place it goes into an NSA database, a hundred percent. Right. Well, that's horrifying. <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, have you guys seen the Simpsons movie? No, I'm not a Simpsons fan. Okay. There, there's a clip in it and like the NSA is sitting there. It's this huge room full of people and they're just typing, they're typing, they're trying to find the Simpsons. And, uh, there, there's a guy like, they're just, it's just one person after another. And it's just showing these people's lives. Like John is saying, and then uh, they actually find the Simpsons and the guy like stands up in this room and he's like, wait, found somebody. <laughs> the NSA finally found someone. <laughs> it's just super funny. Yeah, and yeah. also. And, uh, you know, shortly when we have a new AI model, we won't have to listen to jokes like that anymore. Honestly. Yeah, that's that's also true. But Benefits, unless we ask it to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, I'm really going to have to find a new job. <laughs> it's a financial services company that I won't mention, but they do lots of ads on the television. And they do this thing where if you give them your transactions, they'll, they'll find coupons. But you're given yeah. all your transaction data for free. Yeah. And then they're selling it, of course. Like that's really. Yeah. So I always ask myself, well, there's no such thing as free, right? Right. And somebody wants something from you. What are they going to use it for? Yeah, that's, uh... yeah, honestly, man, like. 
That's that's uh, that's a really good point, Simon. Both of but, you. But here's the thing: that that, that ship has sailed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that stuff's done like that. You know, it, yeah. Who reads the fine print, and we, we all just scroll through it and say, "Agree." Oh yeah. Who re- who reads the terms and conditions? Yeah. Nobody reads the terms and conditions. There's an episode of South Park that talks about that too. <laughs> Remind me, I'll tell you about it later. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, you're welcome. You have an interesting life, though. Right? I do. Yeah. I do. I do try. It revolves I tr- around comics. It does. It does. It does revolve around a lot of cartoons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Explains a lot about my hosting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so here's a question for both of you. What are the long-term implications of AI for the global competitiveness of industry when it comes to producing new products? Um. I, I think it, it, it levels the playing field for a lot of, um, uh, kind of emerging, um, economies. I think it levels the playing field a lot. Uh, we've seen this before. So before, uh, when we were rolling out the internet, China lagged behind as far as like wired internet distribution. Right. But then as soon as wireless internet became available, China was the leader because they never invested in wired internet. So when wireless internet came, they had it everywhere. And then most people here had wired internet. They didn't see the need for wireless internet. So it was a slower adoption here. And I think AI is going to be similar. I think, um, I think some of the countries that don't have the same resources and don't have the same capabilities, I think it's an equalizer uh, when, when you think of it from that standpoint. So I think you're going to see, um, you're going to see more um, globalization of certain types of services and products that we've talked about, uh, and that, you know, Simon alluded to some of these like simple tasks and activities. I think it really levels the playing field for who can participate in some of those, uh, items, because, um, if you're using an AI tool to do some of the, uh, kind of administrative jobs, usually those jobs are done by people that are in your office, right. Or someone that's in your space. But if you're going to use like an AI tool or something to do that, then now that work can be done from anywhere and anywhere. So I think it, it kind of levels the playing field a little bit when it comes to, you know, developing new technologies and new capabilities and where the relevance is going to come in the future. I believe there's going to be a whole bunch of niche markets. So imagine you're a country that's small to medium size. Your school system is excellent. So you're Kids who are educated very well in math and English and their test scores are right up near the top. If you can get, um, there's no need to have giant scale to start new products and services. If you can inherit, you can conquer AI to help you, you can quickly build to scale using artificial intelligence. But you've got to have a smart work. Yeah, I... That is the thing. The more we talk about it and the more that, you know, I've read and listening to both of you, it's uh, AI definitely has a lot of potential, but you still need the operator. You still need that human touch. Um, so, I mean, well, on that note, John, um, really kind of the, I- the idea uh, that you think it'll make it m- more of a level playing field. Do you think that it is possible that if uh, different countries like the U.S. or China get ahead with AI, and implementing that in their society, that there could that that could potentially even further the gap in third world nations. Um, it could, I think, like, um, but but uh, I I don't I don't really see that to be the case. Um, I, I don't think it'll like broaden the gap between like third world and first world. I think it, I think it's it what what was considered third world and first world. Maybe those definitions change. Okay, right. And uh, I mean, China's already beaten us, like with AI adoption and like how they're utilizing it. I think there was a, there was an article and I think China has more, um, manpower like devoted to AI than like every other country in the world combined. Like, Oh wow. That's the, the sheer numbers and volume of like people that they have, uh, to, to work on it. So, uh, I, I think it's, I think, you know, they're very good adopters uh, of technology that other people create. Uh, the Chinese are very good at like taking technology that's developed by others and, and like rolling it out on a mass scale because they have to, because of like the size of their population. So they're really good at doing that. And, uh, I think AI is a tool that, uh, 
they're going to have, there's going to be a lot of benefit for them as it relates to that. Uh, I think some of the other, some other countries that are in this current time that are focused on other things, um, you know, that are focused on um, other priorities, uh, I think they're going to lag behind. I think that's where you're going to see. So I, I think like Russia, I think Russia was, is, there's so much resources for them right now tied up in the war. And, um, and it's so important to their economy, the war that's going on and that, you know, like all the jobs and how they're kind of like, um, have been aligned to the war effort. Um, and so I think they're focused, uh, and they're not focused in the same way. So I, I think like countries like that, for example, I think will lag. And I think countries like China, uh, the United States, um, and others, um, will, will, um, strive and, and, and do well. It is, it is really interesting. Um, on that note, you know, talking about AI and like being able to, to grow and everything of, of that nature, Simon, uh, do you think that AI allows analysts to take really complex data and like turn around and produce it to, to like a non-technical audience? Do you think that this is now a... I think it's good at producing dashboards. For instance. Okay. But one of the things that managers worry about all day, every day is customer churn. It's very expensive to acquire a customer, to lose a customer, especially somebody who has a deep relationship has spent a lot of money with you. So... Companies have all the data that can predict customer churn, but it's quite a challenge to produce a data analytics model that's quite predictive of the fact that John's had a fight with such and such a company and he's likely to take his business somewhere else. If you can figure that out ahead of time and give him a call, there's a good chance you can keep him as a customer. So all the information is there. It's about producing the predictive model to say that company should talk to to john but not me and not you clay yeah that's that's probably a good idea i wouldn't i wouldn't talk to me about investments honestly it's probably <laughs> you'd have things like 10 billion rows but they, as this john was saying they capture data on everything your cell phone right. company the cable company they know exactly what you do Mm-hmm. Man, that is just a horrifying. I'm actually, sense. I'm not, I'm, I'm not horrified. You know, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm one of these people that, you know, I think that it's kind of targeting. You know, the, the I mean, I, I don't think, I think it could be like nefariously used. Um, and sure, there may be isolated incidents where that happens, but like, I'm, I'm a firm believer, believer that Apple and Google and Amazon, they're tracking all of the data because they want to make more money off of me. Right. Right. Yeah. I, that's a, that's what they're a company at the end of the day, and that's their goal. And so I like the fact that when I get on Instagram, and I don't get on there often, but all the products, I want them all. Like, I want everything on there, and it all lines up with me. And so, like, I think it's pretty cool, like, that it listens to me, it listens to my conversations, and then it shows me advertising of stuff that I want to buy. And so I, I actually like that. It's not, it, it doesn't, it, some people, it's like, oh, it freaks me out. Oh, okay. Well, then, then turn your microphone off. You know, you can, you can do that. You can, you know, do those things if you don't want that. But, you know, to me, it makes my life more efficient. I, I don't have to, I don't have to go search on the internet for the latest X, Y, Z gadget. It knows my interest in that. And it's showing me, you know, these items. Uh, and I, and sometimes I don't buy the item that they're showing me, but then I'm like, Ooh, I didn't even know that was available. And then I go and I research and then find some other product that I want. So I actually like the fact that they take all of this information and they try to give us a more curated, uh, experience, you know, whether it's through their application or with Google, with the internet itself, you know, I, I appreciate that that has helped us advance in a lot of different ways. And um, when you look at the information that we've given up and what we've actually lost and what the actual implications to us have been, I, d- I don't know that there's like, um, like I said, it's not like, I, I don't have any problem with the NSA having how many times I turn my windshield wiper on, you know, or anything like that. I mean, uh, they know how fast I drive and nobody's come up and give me a ticket after I've run you know, on the, on the highway. So, uh, you know, that I guess I would get concerned if like all of a sudden I went to renew my driver's license and. They, they, I had all those fines, right? So yeah. now they have average speed in Europe. You might yeah. worry about that. Yeah. So I mean, but like, uh, but I, I don't, I don't like, I, I, I welcome it. I think it's, uh, 
I, I do too. Opposition. I wish way. my phone was tuned to me, so you can type in "there is no point crying over spilt" and it'll put milk. But I always say thanks for, and I wanted to say letting me know, but it says thanks for sharing. You yeah. bloke in Australia says sharing. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for letting me know. But so you can, you know, you can fix that. Yeah, can you? Yeah, you can go in and you can put like those key phrases that you use, and it'll okay. like, remember those. Uh, and so, yeah, you, you can, you can use it that way. Um, but yeah, I, again, it's, it's like any tool. It can be abused. You can abuse a hammer. Well, yeah, that's true. You can abuse a, you know, any kind of tool, any kind of tool can be abused. Uh, and, but I, you know, look, I think it's going to be up to industry and, and universities. Uh, I think it's great for universities to take a, a leading role on like ethics and, and how it should be used, how it shouldn't be used when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, um, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of, you know, ground to cover. Uh, but overall, I think it's a positive thing. I I like it. I think it's a good tool. It helps me be more efficient at, at my job and at my work. Uh, and that and, and that that translates into better returns for my investors because then I'm able to focus on the things that they want me to focus on more. So uh, I think, you know, overall, it, it can be very beneficial and and it's advancing at such a rate. I mean, even if you stay with Chat GPT, they're always updating, and you want to use the right. latest model, and and uh, so it, it's it's um it's a pretty cool tool. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I mean, that's that's a good way to see it. Is more of a more of a glass half full aspect. Um, yeah, because well, I mean, here's the, here. It's not really a glass empty or glass half full. It's like someone's pouring the drink. <laughs> you better have something to catch it in. Right. So you don't really get to choose whether it's half full or not. Like it's coming. It's, yeah. Like it's just <laughs> happening. Like there's yeah. nothing that the individual can do to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at this point in time. So like you can, you can't just hide under a rock and ignore it, you know? Yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's now it's done now. Like it's, yeah. You, the genie's out of the bottle. It's not going back in. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a, well, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's the perfect way to probably put that. It's just, yeah, it just, it is what it is. So. It's here to stay. So, <laughs> um, okay. So, talking about the evolution of, of AI, um, do you guys think that AI will maybe hit a point potentially to where it can start predicting market behaviors and informing investment decisions? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it already does. I think people already do use that uh, for that purpose. Uh, I think people, you know, um, uh, uh, Dr. Sheeler can talk about this more than I do, but, you know, that's what, a lot of hedge funds have done for years is they develop complex models that help them to develop like their competitive edge. And I mean, and they keep those very proprietary and the courts have upheld that, that that technology is proprietary, those algorithms that they create uh, and looking at specific, you know, pieces of data and in a, in a proprietary way, even though it's public data, right. Looking at it in a proprietary way, people already use that to make, investment decisions. There's billions of dollars that are invested that way. Now in, in private equity, um, you know, I think it, you are starting to see, you know, the, the tools, uh, becoming more and more relevant. Um, but I, you know, it's not like, I don't think people are going to be hiring AI to make their investment decisions. It's still, you need a person, right. And like, even now with AI, there's people behind the AI, like it's not AI, Right. right. It's, you know, you're using, you know, um, the computers and you're using uh, the code and you're using the algorithms, you're using all these different tools uh, to simulate artificial intelligence. But there's still people behind like the, the chat GPT is not coming up with its own versions. Right. Right. There's people that are developing the next version, you know, of it. Now, they may be using AI tools to help them to develop it, but there's still people behind that are driving the ship. And so. Uh, at the end of the day, I think that's that's where this is going. Oh, good. Yeah, if you go back to some of these traders, that the, the biggest advantage they have is a short time between when they get the information, they run the algorithm, and put the trade on. So that's their advantage. Is this they just be a little bit ahead of the competitor in terms of time? Well, we are almost out of time, so I've got one more question for both of you. What are the biggest challenges for AI that you see currently in your field, and how do you see AI evolving to help further your fields? 
Uh, well, th- I've got two fields. I've got one field as a dean and sort of the head educator of the students in the business college. There, I want the faculty to continue to embrace this and stay ahead of the curve, like think about ethics, actually get the students to look at how they can use this chat GPT and Microsoft Copilot in a positive way. In my research on data analytics algorithms, i.e. to predict somebody whether they're going to churn or not, I look forward to the time that these AI models can actually think about or suggest to you some different alternative complex models. They're a whole generation away from that. They can't do that at all. Fair enough. John? What was the question again? <laughs> I was so enthralled by Simon's response. Uh, it's, uh, where, where do you see AI? What are the current problems with AI in your field currently, and where do you see it taking your, your industry in the future? As yeah, it? I mean, looking at, uh, in, in, I would say both for industrial and private equity, I would say the biggest problem is people aren't using it enough okay, uh, and not using the tool enough. So I, I think uh, it's just um, uh, taking the time to learn new technology uh, and develop it. It's not really you know, like what private equity is known for. I think, you know, hedge funds are probably more on the technology learning curve uh, because they have more resources devoted to that. Um, and, um, uh, but but I, I think, you know, it's coming, you know, but I think the biggest roadblock is just uh, prioritization of resources. Uh, and I think the firms that do prioritize the resources and uh, utilize the tool, I think you're going to see uh, a step change, you know, for people that do that. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for uh, joining us. Uh, and thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're almost to the end. Let me try that again. Thank you uh, for joining us today for another episode of Executive Sections. And make sure that you subscribe. Yeah, do it again. Yeah, yeah we're going to try it. Sessions. Exact- executive Sessions. Maybe it, is this? I could try it as well. I could try this walking. I would get it right. Probably. We could they do it as Christopher Walken. Thank you for joining for another episode of Executive Sessions. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Also, check out Simon Says on his YouTube channel called Simon Sheather. It's a fun and entertaining look at life with Simon at the School of Gatton Business. A big thanks again to Dr. Simon Sheather and Sir John Stewart of the Stewart Clan uh, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today. Also want to give a huge shout out to Noah Day, Clark Freeman, Andrew Umbricht, and John Stewart II for making this come to life. Well, that'll do it here. And uh, join us next time when we discuss more about trends, developments, and other exciting news surrounding the industrial manufacturing world. We'll see you then. <laughs>